Detective Sergeant John Spooner is opening a file which has remained in limbo for seven years. Though the details are nice now, he hasn't forgotten oh, the information in the search for a young woman who vanished without a trace. Debbie Ray Pritchard finished work behind a bar at the Federal Hotel at 9pm on Saturday, March the 6th, 1982. She went to a party with friends, then to a nightclub where she stood up from her companions and went on alone to the Palais. The doorman saw her leaving there after midnight. He told police she crossed the road and met up with a swarthy, heavy-set man. He wasn't entirely clear whether or not he saw her get into the cab or not with this, this fellow, but a cab did pick her up. And uh, we later, a few days later, we were able to establish that the cab driver on seeing the publicity came forward and rang us. And um, he, he then gave us the information that he'd taken her and this dark fellow uh, out to Lanus Avenue Whitebridge in the vicinity of Whitebridge High School there. And from what inquiries we made, I would say that's the last she was ever seen. The disappearance sparked an intensive search. The cab driver then conveyed the girl and the passenger to this point here where she alighted from the cab and paid the $5 fare. The passenger also got out with her. The girl... Later, items of clothing were found at Kuragang Island leading to another search and more disappointment. In desperation, her parents made a public uh, appeal for help. Again, it was to no avail. Debbie Pritchard hasn't been seen since that night at the Palais. She's seen at a place and then never seen again. It's, uh, there's got to be someone that knows something and hasn't told us, you know. Yeah, yeah. We, we've put every, all the witnesses for <laughs> they, were, uh, they were spoken to two and three times, you know, to, to make sure that nothing was forgotten, but we, we just never come up with anything. Debbie's story is just one haunting case in a growing file of missing persons. On Monday, police will launch a national campaign in a bid to solve some of these mysterious disappearances. Well, what we've tried to do is compile as many photos as we can, including the local people who have been missing for a number of years now, and we'll be taking it to the major shopping centres in the hope that somebody will recognise a photo and perhaps lead us to new evidence. Police are seeking any shred of new evidence on cases which have baffled them for decades. In the meantime, if you believe you can help them to find Debbie Pritchard, call Newcastle Police Station now on 049 29 0999. Some interesting matches on Sunday in the Newcastle Rugby League Premiership with the battle between Western Suburbs and Maitland going a long way to decide who will be minor premiers. It's also Waratah's last chance to hang in on the final five. A loss will see them drop out of the race. The match of the round in Rugby Union appears to be the University Maitland clash and Maitland will be full of confidence after thrashing the Premiership leaders Merriweather Carlton last weekend. In Newcastle men's hockey, Tigers meet Sunnyside, Norths meet South and University and Wests cross sticks. Newcastle Australs have a tough week ahead of them with two matches. One at home against Melita tomorrow and then away to Polonia on Sunday. The game against Australs Polonia on David Sunday Jones two points vital out games for your chances they must win the final both five. matches. Yeah, that's right, Mike. After our good win last week, 1-0 uh, at Wollongong, the game against Melita tomorrow and the game on Sunday against Polonia, if we win them two, I can see us getting in the top four, yeah. This weekend's Sun Herald article was the most recent proclaiming Newcastle as loser in the frigate battle. In a race to be first with the news, there's no room for circumspect headlines, although each has been qualified by the story. Executives of AWS say they are still confident of winning the lucrative the contract, and AWS supporters are in fact taking some heart from the very story which seemed to confirm their worst fears. The editors of the Sun Herald were not available today to say why Newcastle losing the frigate contract only made page one of the Hunter edition of the paper, the other editions carrying the arrest of the murderer. The frigates relegated to a small section on page two. That could either mean that the editors don't believe the frigate contract is that important to the rest of the state, or quite possibly that they don't set as much store by their article as the headline suggests. 
surprisingly, perhaps many Novocastrians are taking the reports with a grain of salt. As far as I know, I think it's going to change. I have no idea. I wouldn't believe what I read in the papers yesterday, that's for sure. Well, it's impossible uh, to say from the, uh, from the reports, but uh, I think realistically uh, Melbourne probably always politically had the edge. I'm ever hopeful uh, the decision hasn't been officially announced as I understand it, and uh, we're still in there. Although it says the reports are encouraging, Amicon is far from claiming victory. Indeed, only today the consortium continued its battle to win over Hunter residents. New South Wales Premier Nick Reiner has reacted angrily to the leaks and, and has called on Minister Beasley to, to quickly put the rumours stage. to rest. But uh, I guess common sense tells you that uh, the leaks that we have, the ones you refer to, are inspired leaks. The Defence Department doesn't normally uh, leak too much of its own accord on something as important as this. So uh, I would obviously share uh, the concern that you describe. In an interview recorded well, for know, tonight's Newsnight, to Mr Griner also I admitted would, uh, George Keegan's uh, assertion that a deal had been done with Amicon when the Federal Government government sold at the Williamstown dockyard was a possibility. At face value, you could be forgiven for believing that. Uh, I really have no more information than, than Mr Keegan. I don't know if it was sold on a nod and a wink. Uh, I suppose, given that there's not much private sector work for Williamstown to do, uh, uh, there might be something in what George Keegan says, but clearly I have no inside information on it, John. Is there any reason at all to be confident of that? Brigades from three stations were called to the blaze at the rear of Newcastle Auto Electrics on Throsby Street shortly after 8am. Firefighters say it took less than 10 minutes to bring the flames under control, but intense heat and smoke caused extensive damage throughout the small workshop. It's believed the fire broke out in a washing booth containing petrol and thinners used to clean electrical components. Staff at the site attempted to extinguish the fire but were beaten back by the heat. Although damage was extensive, the fire brigade spokesman said the quick response probably avoided a far worse situation. Professor Jack Cam has received the J.P. Thompson Medal of the Royal Geographical Society of Australasia for his work on this atlas which was released for the bicentenary. Peter Irwin has been awarded the Macdonald Holmes Medal for the teaching of the subject. Newcastle University has a strong reputation in the teaching of geography, however the department is concerned that plans by the federal government to implement an Australian studies course in schools will see geography drop from the curriculum and the study of the subject at tertiary level affected. Uh, it would affect university level geography because if geography was to disappear as a separate entity in the schools, uh, then the numbers of students coming through to university uh, with a geographic experience would be much fewer than it is at present. The $150 million baby won't be officially born until the 1990s, but already there's intense lobbying for a new name. Of the eight names being considered by the expectant minister, only a few are likely to rate. The first and most obvious choice is to call it Rankin Park Hospital, but technically there already is one. The second option, Newcastle Teaching Hospital, is considered a little dull. Then there's the other suggestions. Biraban Hospital, named after a prominent Aboriginal leader in Lake Macquarie's early settlement. Dr. Barker Hospital, after a pioneer of the public health movement. Or perhaps Carolyn Chisholm Hospital, after the woman on the $5 bill. Mine owner, editor and union leader James Fletcher is on the list, although that name has already been appropriated by the Hunter Hospital, which now means the Hunter Hospital is back in the running as a possibility. And lastly, in a wider patriotic gesture, the Southern Cross Hospital, believed to be highly favoured among influential health officials. The final decision will be announced by the Health Minister when he inspects the hospital on the 8th of September. The quality of medical and paramedical...
The trash is in fact worth a fortune because it is all handmade as major props for the musical cats. As well as the crafted rubbish, there's 40 tonnes of equipment, including a false stage floor, steel support towers and electrical wiring. 30 local people are involved in the construction of the make-believe trash heap that will be home for the production during its Newcastle stay. It's expected the set will take three days to complete, with crews working 12 to 16 hours a day. Technical coordinator for the show, Lats Hoffman, says besides set construction, a lot of other backstage work goes into the show. Well, keeping the cast happy with by putting carpet down, uh, the wardrobe people have got to come in and get the costumes ready. Uh, there's the wigs people who work very hard from the moment they walk in and open their cases. While there's no kitty litter boxes on set, there are plenty of unusual sights. Everything on the cat stage is three times the size of normal life, turning this humble broken down stove into a plywood and canvas masterpiece. And for those who want to take home a piece of this musical phenomenon, there's a special cat shop. Darren Curtis for NBN News. It's called Stadium Off-Road Racing. Drivers who usually race courses with 100 km circuits through the bush are confined to 600 metre laps, with tight corners and specially constructed jumps. The faster you go, the better it is, the smoother it is and very exhilarating, it's great. Singleton's Jan Louie is one of only two women off-road racers in Australia. The national champion, Jan says, compared to normal off-road racing, stadium racing is far more intense. There's a big difference with it. Um, when we race over five or six hundred kilometres, you're sort of wanting to last the car and not pushing it too hard. But out here on Saturday night, we'll be pushing them hard and going as hard as we can. Seven different classes will be racing on Saturday. From the 1200cc two-wheel drive buggies to the big four-wheel drive V8s. Cars like this Ford Bronco are valued in excess of $50,000. With the radiator in the back of the vehicle to distribute weight for jumps, Four shock absorbers on each wheel, Bronco has been built for the tough stuff. Even though some of the races have got 450 horsepower under the hood, the drivers will be limited to below 100 kilometres per hour on the tight motodrome track. Peter Ryan, NBN News. Seventeen-year-old Chad Stevenson and eighteen-year-old Paul Henderson will head off next weekend for two athletics meetings in Japan. Australia, China and the host nation will clash in the meets, the first in Osaka with the second in Totori, and 43 junior athletes will carry the hopes of Australia. Both Henderson and Stevenson are well ranked in the 100 metres and 200 metres in open company, as well as junior ranks, and there's not much between their respective 100 metre times. Paul has run a 10.56100, while Chad's best time is 10.63. Coach Max Debon is pleased the meets are taking place, as it adds to the experience of the athletes. We're getting more competition now over the latter years, and um, these, especially the juniors. And this uh, trip that we're going to Japan, um, it'll, it's a forerunner to the uh, World Junior Championships in Bulgaria next year. Max also feels that Paul and Chad are primed to break the Commonwealth Games qualifying time for the 100 metres of 10.54 seconds, and it should happen in Japan. Well, I'm very pleased with their training at the moment. They've been zipping along quite well, and uh, we're hoping over in Japan that they will get a qualifier in. And once they've qualified, then uh, it all comes down to the final selection trials for the Commonwealth Games in Sydney in early December. And what is known about the opposition they will face? We just don't know for sure uh, what the compilation of both teams will be, but they should be very, very strong.
Today, the whole Australian team was in camp at Holmesville putting the finishing touches to their programs before they leave next Sunday. Over 1,000 competitors will gather in Canada and will encompass some 12 countries. It's a milestone also for the Newcastle Club, which has only been operating for five years, as they have no fewer than eight members in the 15-member team. Led by Brian Hayes, the current Australian Shito Roo champion and second-degree black belt, Newcastle is also represented by Charlene Machen of West Walls End, who is the New South Wales All-Styles champion, Warren Tresseter, the Australian Under-15 All-Styles champion 1988, and also Andrew Wallace, a proficient Shito Roo exponent. And the youngsters haven't been forgotten as Martin Phillips, Brent Newstead, Jason Shelley and Michael Thompson, all from Newcastle, will form the synchronised Carter team at the world titles. Each competitor will have to take part in two disciplines, fighting or sparring and forms of Carter, which are the traditional moves of Shito Ru handed down to Westerners from the founding families in Japan. The winners will be determined on combined points and on today's showings of sparring and Carter, Australia and indeed Newcastle could boast some new world champions in August. Cole Bentley. It was a gallant effort in season 89 for the first grade team and only their second year in the big time they have missed the cut by a couple of games but at the same time they have signalled to all their arrival as a force in the Winfield Cup. And their breeding ground, the President's Cup team, has created a club record that can never be broken. The first Newcastle Knights senior team to qualify for the finals. Yesterday they were always in control of their match against Penrith and ran out easy winners 18-4. For coach Good Robert Finch, it's a marvellous achievement. The boys have worked very hard. They've been in training since October and uh, they're just starting to bear fruit uh, this year. We've been doing working hard for probably 18 months. Uh, we had, we did have hopes in the first year, really, probably a little bit high, but uh, they've worked very hard and they do deserve all the success that they've had so far. With two matches remaining, including the bye from Brisbane, the President's Cup side is in with a real show of grabbing the double chance. Yes, yeah, so we can come up with a, uh, an extra win on South Sydney. Uh, the percentages are far better than South Sydney. We'll have a second shot at the uh, Cherry. Even with this current success, Robert Finch and the players have not lost track of their real purpose for playing. We feel that... Uh, that's where we've got to teach them all the basic fundamentals, the skills to, uh, to achieve the first grade goal. And it's not only the under-21s who could figure in the end of season fixtures. The reserve grade, coached by David Waite, is in equal six position, one point outside the five. Their road home is a little rockier than the under-21s, with games against Brisbane, North and the leaders Parramatta. But their win yesterday against a tough Penrith side was full of merit. It was a last minute try to Greg Hayward that sealed the win, and Robert Finch feels that if they keep fighting, they can make the finals. They've been on that track for the last couple of weeks, and... Uh, as, as you've seen yesterday, the result, they come from behind again to, to win and uh, I think that their team spirit especially and uh, the leadership of, uh, of Michael Reid will, will uh, stand them in good stead for the future weeks. Of course, the first grade now... Uh... Education Week this year is to strive for success and it certainly started on a positive note with the launching ceremony at Maker this afternoon. Hundreds of city school children crowded the heritage mall to watch a host of acts planned in honour of the occasion by local schools. Bring everything from choirs to dancing to a clever display of precision skipping. The task of launching the Hunters Education Week went to Dr Marlene Goldfield on behalf of Education Hasn't Minister the Terry Medrell. In formally declaring Education Week in the Hunter region officially open. Dr Goldfield passed on several messages the from Minister the Minister, all of them the praising the achievements of Hunter schools in the education arena. This week we'll see local schools taking their achievements to the community with displays, concerts and activities aimed at promoting education and involving as many people as possible.
passing motorist noticed a glow coming from the rear of the building and saw two men running from the area as he called fire units. The fire burned well into early morning, destroying everything in the 50 metre shed. An ANZ banking complex adjoining the shed escaped with only minor heat and smoke damage. Owners of the shed, Norm Ecott Removals, estimate goods from up to 80 homes were stored in the shed at the time of the fire, most of it uninsured. The majority of the furniture was stored as an interim measure, while elderly people moved from their homes into retirement villages. Their losses are uncountable. Arson squad detectives and fire investigation officers believe the fire was deliberately lit and are continuing their inquiries. Darren Curtis for NBN News. Means that it wouldn't have Firefighters the and scientific police sifted through the remains this morning looking for the cause of a fire which destroyed everything. Fire brigade officials say the location of the home gave them little time to save the dwelling or contents. It is isolated, it is well away from the road and the water supply being some distance they had to rely on the water from the Morissette tanker to attack the fire. Police say the fire broke out at about 6am while 41-year-old Coralian Van Dyen was driving her rail commuter husband, William, to the station. When she returned, the $90,000 house was an inferno. Thinking the children were still asleep, she ran into the fire. 11-year-old Michaela was outside, 14-year-old Jared was slower to get out. His feet were badly burned by molten <laughs> synthetic carpet. Mother and son were both burned on the face, neck and arms. The stunned husband answered urgent calls to return from work in Sydney to find his rented home in ruins and most of the family in hospital. While he consoled his daughter who was staying with friends, firefighters contacted the hospital and relayed good news. Wife and son were both OK. Um, they've been moved out of casualty into another ward. They're talking, but they've got painkillers and things like that. You must be comforted to know that they uh, survived. Oh, definitely. That was my biggest concern when I first heard. So it was great. We couldn't even contact the hospital at first from Sydney because they uh, didn't know what was going on. And it was a great relief to get here and find out that we were OK. Experts now suspect the fire started in a power board in the dining room of the seven-month-old house. Almost all the family's possessions valued at about $70,000 were lost. Only the family pet, Shogun, still has a roof over his head. Tom Hilston for NBN News. Any other types of dangerous contaminated in the waste each should go in the appropriate bag. Then bend your knees and use your legs to do the lifting. Newcastle Keeping Hospital your back straight, one, it was time two, to three. Tackle the yes. issue head on. The main thing are the small silly things that we do that interfere with productivity and um, make us unhappy, which often can be countered by simple paying attention to things, doing things the right way, wearing the gloves when you're supposed to wear gloves, and eye protection when you're supposed to wear it, this kind of thing. So it was Australia. that Don't Be a Deal was created, a comical 18-minute video aimed at promoting on-the-job safety and deal. featuring the vital ingredient in most work mishaps, the deal, better known as local actor-comedian Greg Dunham. Needle stick injuries are very common and potentially very dangerous. Never attempt to re-sheath a used needle. Oh, oh, oh. A needle stab wound at this point could give you an infectious disease. <coughs> Don't be a bill. Deposit used needles immediately into a specially designed puncture-proof container. The video Sharp deals with a variety of problem of areas under such bags. titles as Dills and Spills, Dills and Lifting and Remember, Dills and Needles. Somebody has to All of the segments were you. shot at the Royal Newcastle Hospital using its own staff. Today the video was launched for local representatives Back, of the health industry. But damage. already the unit has made plans to circulate it Australia-wide as a vital safety reference for employees Still working using in the, the medical field. Cabinet. 